Hello and welcome to Copico Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Galdera with Kamehameha Schools Communications. Mahalo for joining us. We're looking forward to the end of 2020 and 2021 starting to ramp up, and we really appreciate you tuning in, whether it's on YouTube or via many audio platforms too, depending on how you prefer to get your Copico Podcast. So we really appreciate that. Um, attention that you're giving to some of the great issues, some of the Native Hawaiian education and leadership issues that we talk about here on the podcast. And it's a, a nice approach to providing that information through a Native Hawaiian lens. So again, we really appreciate your, your attention to some of the great things we're trying to bring to the public. And our guest today is actually somebody I've really been looking forward to talking to because back uh, in March of 2019, when we first decided to launch Kupiko Podcast, our guest today, Brandon Ledward, was actually part of the brainstorm team that allowed us to come up with the concept and, and some of the approaches that we took and are still taking here on the podcast. So mahalo, Brandon, for joining us. Mahalo, Kyle, and thank you so much for that um, warm welcome. It is really exciting to be a part of the podcast. And I do remember those conversations back in March um, when this uh, show was just a dream. Uh, and yeah. mahalo to you for carrying the torch forward. Some amazing, amazing content. And our 25th episode, right? Yeah, this is actually a, a, a milestone because, as Brandon said, it's our 25th episode. And it's also the last episode of 2020. So it kind of it, it brings a closure to the year, but also is going to set us up from some nice conversations leading into the new year as well. And for those who might not be familiar with Brandon, he's a principal strategist at our Kamehameha Schools, all in our Kamehameha Schools Ohana as part of the Strategy and Transformation Group. So before we jump in today, actually, Brandon, uh, as a, in our discussion about data and Native Hawaiians and how everything works together, can you kind of tell us a little bit about your position and how your work with Strategy and Transformation is not only affecting KS, but also the Native Hawaiian community as well? Definitely, mahalo, Kyle. Um, so what we do in strategy and transformation, I, really simply, is I think we keep the organization and our Lahui futures ready um, because we really try to develop foresight about what's what's changing in the world, um, what possible futures are coming our way. Um, and then we also want to harness insight from a vast amount of data. So we do research and evaluation, um, environmental scanning, and we really want to create indicators for our Lahui well-being. Um, so one of the main things that we do is we, we start to look at not just educational outcomes of our learners, which are important, but let's think about how are they doing economically? How are they doing spiritually, emotionally? How are they doing physically with health outcomes? So within our Ohana of Kamehameha Schools, strategy and transformation is really a thought partner to support our leaders um, as they, they think about really big issues. And we hopefully help them ask better questions uh, and find the data that they need to make the decisions. Uh, and ultimately, we know those decisions are, are made on behalf of our communities. So while we serve, you know, Kamehameha schools, we always have a Lahui mindset that um, if we can help redefine some of these uh, indicators of success, if we can institutionalize different ways of collecting data, then we could support community-based nonprofits, Native Hawaiian families, organizations, everyone down the line. Okay. And that's a great way to start today because you mentioned, you know, really providing data and, and holistic ways to approach how we serve our Lahui. And one of the things we really stress at Kamehameha Schools in particular is normalizing Ola Lo Hawaii, you know, trying to bring back and perpetuate the language. But along with language, we also want to perpetuate and normalize data because it's hard to make plans and move ahead when you haven't really evaluated your current and past states. So can you kind of compare that idea of, you know, normalizing data and really making it something that you want to make standard and, and push on compared to something like Olalo or even culture too? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you think about Olalo and culture as being uh, really key, key parts of a thriving Lahui, of a, a thriving community, then I think data is a key part too because you need to be collecting information about how your stakeholders, how your community members are doing. Um, and so you're right, I think at Kamehameha Schools, we've really been committed to normalizing Olelo uh, and culture uh, mm -hmm. amongst our staff and in our communities, um, because that really is our foundation. 
that that's our kahua. Um, and similarly, I think if we look back at Ikavakahiko, our kupuna, they were they were amazing researchers, um, empirical data collectors. I mean, you had to be right if you're circumnavigating the world, if you're developing um, aquaponic things like local ia or mm -hmm. um, or creating laau la lapaau um, medicinal techniques. You had to be really keen um, observers of nature and also scientists. Um, and if you look back at our history too, um, we used, we did senses. We took senses of our people, umi ali loa, by stacking stones. Um, well before you know, folks were doing senses in the kind of the Western world. Um, right. And one example I like to talk about is um, you know Kamu Inos used to be at Mao Farms and now he's at um, UH has an office of OBB Innovation. Um, oh wow. And okay. Kamu. Yeah, so so that's even exciting, you know, data point. We have an yep. office of OEV innovation at UH. Um, so Kamu's dad, Eric Enos, you know, started Kaala Farms a long time ago. Um, and Kamu would always talk about, you know, the fact that Native Hawaiians, the makahiki wasn't just a time for, you know, celebrating and, and you know, playing games. It was for him data collection and reporting because it was a time for the chiefs to go through the different ahupua and basically take stock. How plentiful is the land? How well managed is the land? How fit are the people? How well are they taking care of themselves? So mm -hmm. again, it just matters how you look at it. If you think about data as a as a computer or something, um, you know, you can only do through some kind of formal way, then you might think, is that in our history? But if you think about always getting information, learning from it, and and experimenting and innovating, absolutely part of our our history. So you're right. I think normalizing data collection, research, and that kind of data science would be huge for our people. Okay. And and on that note, you know, especially when we see surveys and various data points in the media, a lot of times we, we really focus on the negatives. You know, what are the deficits that certain people or communities face? Just because, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of human nature to really be drawn to that rather than the feel good stories. But why is it important to have that balance? So in particular with Native Hawaiians, you know, you're going to look at the deficits and what needs to be improved. But why do you need that balance of, oh, what are Native Hawaiians or our communities doing well to help our people? Why, why is that duality and balance important? Yeah, it's so important, Kyle. Um, and for, I think for a lot of Indigenous and minority peoples, you know, who are in some ways are defined by the deficits, the, the data that's deficits based. Right. So, I mean, if you talk to the average person, right, um, they might know that typically Native Hawaiians have a shorter lifespan um, than non-Hawaiians. They, they typically have higher mortality, especially from cancer. They suffer from chronic illnesses like diabetes and heart disease um, disproportionately. Um, they're all, we're, Native Hawaiians are overrepresented in the prison system. You know, we're about a quarter of the population, um, yet we make up about 40% of the prison population. Um, we know that educational attainment for Native Hawaiians is typically lower. Um, one in five Native Hawaiians don't graduate high school on time. Um, mm -hmm. And as a result, a lot of Native Hawaiians work in low wage jobs um, and are, and have some of the highest poverty and homelessness rates in the state. So those are the things that, that, are, that are true. Um, and they are deficits because those are outcomes we wish we didn't have. Um, mm -hmm. But we also have strength-based data or, or we can focus on the assets. You know, our population is growing. Do you know that it's expected for Native Hawaiians? Um, there will be over a million Native Hawaiians in the world by 2050 and almost 1.25 million Hawaiians by 2060. So we're wow. a growing population. And that okay. means that we're going to have increased political influence. Um, and and that, that's exciting. Um, we have some of the highest physical activity rates for youth and adults. Um, we're seeing some increases in college enrollment over recent years and completion. We're seeing some decreases in the economic disadvantage um, kind of categories. But the things that I think we don't have enough data around are how we live our culture. Um, so the importance of ohana, the, the cultural values of, of mm -hmm. malama and oloha aina. Um, so what little data we do have, Native Hawaiians typically um, report higher rates of community belonging sense of place um, than the non-Hawaiians do. Um, mm -hmm. We also learned recently that Native Hawaiian-owned businesses um, are less dependent on tourism 
and therefore they, they potentially offer us a blueprint for um, a new economic horizon uh, with more regenerative tourism. Uh, you know, and then you have stuff that you don't necessarily have, you know, hard data for, but you just feel. So some of the things that, you know, the researchers uh, in our team uh, and our partners feel is, you know, there's more Native Hawaiian scholarship, more scholars, um, you know, writing articles, doing research. There's more Native Hawaiian faculty at UH, which is a great mm -hmm. change, a welcome change. Um, we're yeah. seeing more civic engagement and activism, especially among the youth um, for Native Hawaiians, which is a sign of what we call collective efficacy, the ability of, of communities to mobilize and respond to issues that matter to them. You know, so um, Mauna Kea, Malama Honua, um, the push for Hawaiian language and immersion schools, um, a lot of social capital there. And then right. even more recently, I think there's been a lot of conversation around um, social entrepreneurship and innovation. And there's a lot of Oevi Native Hawaiian leaders in that space. So there's a lot of exciting things to look for. Why it's important is because no people are based on just their deficits. Unfortunately, most of the data that we collect is skewed that direction. And unless we actively seek out new data to balance it and to focus on the things that we're doing well, we run the risk of people telling a story about us that only focuses on the negative. Um, and that, yeah. that's the real danger. Okay, so as we try to paint that kind of well-rounded, more full picture, what else can be done to, to bolster data collection and, and maybe different methods or even just getting folks to understand why it's important to engage in that process? You know, you mentioned census earlier, and I know there's yeah. still a great deal of people that don't see the value in participating, even though everybody that registers or, or answers generates, you know, more funding for certain populations. So it's extremely important. So how do we how do we make that effort to really bolster that data collection these days? Yeah, it, it's such a good question. Um, one, I think we just we have to acknowledge that I think a lot of the mistrust and the fear comes from a history as indigenous people, um, you know, where we've experienced historical trauma. Um, we deal with structural racism, you know, on, on a daily basis. So there is kind of a, an inbuilt built fear to sharing information or, um, or just a questioning of, of why that's being, being collected. Um, the other thing is the reality is that a lot of data that's collected doesn't transform into value for the people that gave the data. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's, 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 it is extractive, you know, data researchers come take data and it never comes back. So two things right off the bat, we have to acknowledge, you know, that one, there is kind of historical trauma and an experience of colonialism occupation that, um, that exists. Um, mm -hmm. Two, we also have to recognize that part of the, the opportunity is that if you do not participate and if you do not share your perspectives, um, your mana'o, your experiences, then someone else is speaking for you. And that's the danger, again, for Indigenous peoples, is that um, if you don't participate uh, in, in data collection efforts, then you could be silenced, which is, again, another kind of violence against Indigenous peoples. Um, and then now we also have, on top of all that, just the fear of, of big data, you know, that's being harvested by companies and yeah. personally identifiable information. I, I, I get that, you know, people are really reticent to share. Um, so I think it starts with education. Um, like I mentioned, remembering, and I always look to our past. So our IK Kupuna um, and our history tells us that we're not afraid of data. In fact, we use data to do magnificent things. Um, the difference is that we want to be in a seat of influence when it comes to how that data is being used. So I think part of the work that we can do, um, and we have partnerships with Lili Okalani Trust, Office of Hawaiian Affairs, a number of groups to create um, research partnerships that sort of credentialize each other and also give a room for community to uh, give feedback on the types of research that's being done. What are the questions that are being asked? How is the data being collected? How will it be used? The more you let people be a part of that process, the less they'll be afraid of sharing that information. Okay, we're getting a lot of uh, great IKM Manao <laughs> today from Brandon Ledward. He's a principal strategist with our Kamehameha Schools Strategy and Transformation Group. And they do a lot of great work, including, as you alluded to, Brandon, you know, partnering with other Native Hawaiian serving organizations. And one of the new projects that you are helping to lead forward is actually a new survey 
that KS has collaborated on that going back to your previous point really helps us to provide some great data points that we can use both in the now and in the future. So can you tell us a little bit about this survey and, and what you're trying to gain from, from the data collected? Definitely. You know, we're really excited. We have a long history of partnership, um, research partnerships with different organizations. Um, but in the last, you know, five or six years, we've really gone deep with um, the Leo Kalani Trust and Office of Hawaiian Affairs because um, I think our three organizations share a commitment to, to research and also more realistically, we have a commitment to transforming how we talk about Native Hawaiian well-being. Um, we mentioned the deficits-based versus strength-based. Um, there's also, you know, ways that you look at well-being as it's only economic or you know, financial health and your physical health. Um, and we want to expand that. And we want to talk about, you know, these dimensions from a more OEV perspective. So, for instance, uh, we talk about the idea of EA, sovereignty. Mm -hmm. um, which you could measure, right, in terms of do Native Hawaiians have uh, their own government? Some would argue they do or they don't in this in this very moment. Um, right. But what we suggested was, why don't we ask, you know, Native Hawaiian families, like, where do they experience um, EA in their lives? Like, where do they have authority and control and agency? Um, agency is a big thing with our AOLA standards that we're working on on our campuses and our partnerships, because we want folks to have the the ability to make change in the world. So we want to find out where, where are those things happening because they don't often come or they're not often collected through our state agencies. Um, you know, these are more community stories. Um, so so the survey that we're working on now is called the Hawaii Community Wellbeing Survey. Okay. <laughs> really, really creative title, huh? We, I'm sure we could have gone better. It tells you it was written by researchers. But um, <laughs> right to the point. Basic, yeah, right to the point. It is what it is. Um, and, and it's a survey that's being, it's actually in the field right now. Um, and but you can be Native Hawaiian or non-Native Hawaiian to take the survey. We actually want to know how we're doing. And the, the purpose of the survey is really to collect information, like you said, to understand the well-being of our people and our communities. Um, so we focus, we ask a lot of questions about cultural practices, use of olelo. We mm -hmm. ask about um, connections to aina, um, stewardship, uh, volunteerism. You know, we also ask very timely now about digital connectivity. Um, so when there's gaps in, in access to broadband or internet capable devices, we want to know that so we can respond. Um, right. But ultimately, yeah, the data will be used to to help our organizations with you know our planning to make sure that we're providing the best services for our people. Um, but the long play is actually to start to collect more information so that we shift the conversation about well-being to move towards the strengths that you talked about and to define well-being, not just in terms of I'm making money and I'm healthy to I'm doing that, but I'm also giving back to my communities. I'm raising, you know, um, kids with character. You know, mm -hmm. I, I'm a strong com committed advocate of my community. I'm involved with political issues that affect me. All these things that we, we know we want from any, um, any contributor to our Lahui. So it's your chance. I would just encourage you guys if you you may get invited to participate in this survey um, by email or you may get a phone call or a postcard. Um, you can always check with us to make sure it's legitimate. <laughs> but um, I would really encourage you guys to participate. We'll probably be collecting data all the way through uh, February. So lots of times to yeah. to participate. And maybe we'll put something up on the website, Kyle, so people, folks can, yeah. can find more information. So for all our viewers and listeners, I actually was able to take the survey earlier this week as we were preparing for the podcast. And it, it only takes about, you know, 10 to 15 minutes. There's quite a few questions, but it's it's multiple choice and there's a, there's some short answer, but it, it moves very quickly. And that, that data is gonna be very important. So you can participate as Brandon mentioned by, um, actually, as you look at and listen to this podcast, the little summary below the podcast will actually have the link. So you can just hit that and, and go right to the survey as soon as you finish listening to us. And that's kind of our, our cue to wrap it up today. So before we do that, Brandon, maybe do you have any parting words for folks that are getting interested in, in this data mindset, normalizing data, and also looking ahead to this important survey? Yeah, thank you so much again, Kyle, for all your work on this podcast, because part of the, the goal of collecting data is not just to have the data, 
It's to have the conversation that leads to the change. So I think the fact that you're here on a regular basis, just probing our, you know, stretching our thinking, probing different topics, sharing the great work that um, that's happening across our organization and community is exactly what we need. Um, yeah, I would just say that, you know, where we are right now in this year, it's it's been a crazy year. Um, it's an understatement. But I, yeah, as, as, and like you said, in some ways we're looking forward to 2021. Um, but I, I would think that the the disruptions that we felt, um, some of the upheaval, um, these things are not going to go away. And while I think COVID-19 has obviously taken the spotlight uh, recently, we still have climate change. We still have economic inequality, some big, big rocks, um, social justice, you know, um, issues that we have to attend to. So um, I guess what I, I would suggest is that the more that we um, we look to the future with with the understanding that We've always been researchers as Native Hawaiians. We've always been innovative thinkers. We've always used data. Um, let's think about how we can build on that legacy and expand you know, the types of experiments and innovations we do so that we can truly bring transformational change to our communities. If anything, we see that our system in many ways is broken, or I should say, it's producing unhealthy outcomes. But it takes all of us to, to reboot that system. You can't sit outside and blame someone. So I think at the very least, you know, getting in the conversation around data, asking about well-being um, of, of your Native Hawaiian uh, family and community is a little first step that we can all take to start to move us in the direction we want for a brighter future. Awesome. Well, mahalo, Brandon, for your time today. And for all the listeners and viewers, be sure to not only consider data and keep that top of mind, but be sure to take that survey because it's going to go a long way in impacting our, our Native Hawaiian community, building OEV leaders, and really uplifting the Lahui, which is some of our uh, top priorities, not only at Kamehameha Schools, but in the Native Hawaiian community as well. So again, for Brandon, I'm Kyle. Take care and aloha.